Okay, now we are still on the second question, and we have talked about how the Manchus managed to keep the mandate of heaven pretty successfully for about 200 years. Um, the second reason, uh, second set of things I want to talk about in terms of how did the Manchus maintain its rule over the high majority was because they inherited key ideologies and institutions from the past dynasties in China. On that one, I want to first talk about Confucianism and the civil service examination, the importance of that. The Manchu Qing rulers almost immediately adopted Confucianism and used the main ideologies in Confucianism to keep the Chinese population pacified, to show the signal that there isn't any fundamental change after all. We value your moral qualities and we're going to continue promote such qualities. And that really won the heart of, uh, not immediately, but slowly won the heart of the Chinese literati and the educated classes. Especially the Manchu rulers emphasized on filial piety and loyalty. Filial piety and loyalty are two parallel qualities. Filial piety is as a son and a daughter, how you're supposed to serve your parents. And a loyalty is how as a subject or official, you're supposed to serve your ruler. I want to tell you one interesting story about how the Manchu Qing promoted loyalty after it had consolidated its rule. So during the Ming Qing transition, there were many Ming generals and officials who wholeheartedly fought against the Manchus, refused to surrender to the Manchus, and died for the Ming Emperor. However, there were also some Ming officials who surrendered or collaborated with the Manchus. And the Manchus, of course, initially really appreciated the help from the Han Chinese because they know how to conquer China and maintain the, the Manchu rule long term and win the heart of the Chinese people. But once the Manchu Qing felt that its rule in China had been pretty solid, they started to promote the main heroes who had fought against them. They compiled two books. One is about the, loyal, the main loyalists. In other words, the past enemies of the Manchus. And as for the Chinese, the main officials who collaborated with the Qing in its conquest of China. The Manchu Qing ruler compiled a book called Twice Served Ministers. Because of the contributions these people made to the Qing, the Qing rulers can't really openly criticize them, but the name, I think, revealed their stand on this twice served ministers, which is definitely not a good title you want to win in Chinese culture. Anyway, so these are the key values from Confucianism that the Manchu emperors promoted. I want to show you guys a piece of primary documents. This is the secret edict of the Kangxi emperor. I'm gonna mention this guy in a little bit. In 1670, about 30 years after the founding of the Qing dynasty, right? And I don't know if you guys can see it clearly, but it was promoting all the essential Confucian values in order to keep the family and the clients stable, and thus the whole empire stable. So we know that the way to institutionalize Confucianism is through the civil service examination. All the educated people are supposed to learn it and use that to pass the civil service examination in order to enter official them. This is a major way to change your fate and to change your social status in pre-modern China. So every generation in the past, the young people, as long as they can afford basic education, strive to read and to write in Confucian classic style and pass the civil service examination. So the Manchu Qing rulers decided to continue with this practice. 
Throughout the Qing Dynasty, the civil service examination continued, which means that the Han Chinese literati still have a way to move up in the social ladder and become someone, become someone important in this alien ruled empire. Now you may don't think this is much more, really much impressive, but compare it to what the Mongols did. Mongols once also conquered China, and they established the Yuan Dynasty, Y-U-A-N, Y-U-A-N, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty only lasted for 93 years, less than one century. One of the reasons was that not only the Mongols imposed a racial hierarchy, now this is really a racial hierarchy on the Chinese, although people didn't realize in such terms, one of the most notorious thing is that they discontinued the civil service examination. So there's no way out for the Chinese, for the very proud, sophisticated Chinese literati. They have to maintain forever the subjects, the oppressed, under the Mongols. There is no way for them to change that. And the Manchus did a very different thing, with continuing the civil service examination. Other than that, the Manchus transform themselves very successfully from horseback riders to civilized rulers. They adopted all the important Chinese institutions and ruling technologies, including ruling techniques, sorry, including uh, keeping the morning, the habit of morning meetings every morning between the emperor and the officials. Basically, everybody had to get up at 5 o'clock, 5 a.m. to talk about important decisions or policies in the empire, right? This is also a way for the, for the emperor to be constantly connected and remain collegial with the officials. And they also, um, like we said before, develop their own language although the most important official documents are always written in uh, the Mongol language, the Manchu language, and the Chinese language. And they kept the important rituals and ceremonies from the past dynasties. So if you visit Beijing, China now, I hope that you go to the um, Palace of Heaven located in western part of China. This is a beautiful, uh, gigantic building here you're looking at on this image. So this building is for the, Chi for the Chinese emperor in the past and the Manchu empires now, emperors now to go to the suburb of Beijing on his own and pray for the next year's harvest for the whole empire, for his subjects, right? So these rituals have really important symbol symbolic meanings among the Chinese population. They know that their emperor, despite being a Manchu, still care about them and uh, is capable of being a benevolent ruler. And the adoption and respect toward Chinese ideologies, rituals, and customs, and also self-cultivation skills are fully demonstrated by the Kangxi Emperor, who is known as a, or who want to dress himself up as a sage king, sage ruler, Confucian sage king of China. You have two images of the Kangxi Emperor. He becomes emperor at age six and stopped his rule at age 61 or two or something. So he was one of the longest ruled um, emperors in China. He was obviously a Manchu ruler wearing the Manchu emperor's outfit in the image on the left, right? But on the, on the right, uh, Kangxi, in his many portraits, show himself as a classic Chinese scholar holding the calligraphy, sitting with what's probably the Confucian texts on the desk against a Chinese style uh, decoration, a Chinese scale, uh, style screen behind him. Not only he show his image as such, he really implemented 
what a sage king in China would do. He studied diligently the Confucian texts, and he converse with his Han officials with perfect Chinese classic language, and he wrote poems. Uh, he had the daily routine of practicing several skills fit for Chinese scholar, music, calligraphy, poem, and doing self-reflections. In one word, he was a royal champion of Confucian morality. So, of course, he also continued with what's required or what's expected from a good mental ruler. He was uh, very good with archery and horse riding and all that. But what really made him the sage king among the Chinese literati's hearts was his adoption of all these Chinese, uh, Chinese or Confucian values and skills. And at the institutional level, the Manchu Qing inherited the whole centralized bureaucracy from the Ming Dynasty prior to theirs. And you can read from your book about uh, their idea of ruling a big empire using a small, efficient bureaucracy made up of Chinese scholars or Manchu scholars who have passed the civil service examination. Okay. So that's uh, what I have to say about the second question. How did the Manchus maintain its rule over the Han majority? Think about the core idea of mandate of heaven and think about all the important ideologies and institutions that the Manchu Qing continued and relied on to rule the uh, mass Chinese population. Okay, so the Chinese was not only uh, was not the only ethnic group under the Manchu rule. There were many others, especially because the Manchus are very good fighters, and they keep expanding their empire to include the current day Inner Mongolia and Outer Mongolia. So the current uh, People's Republic of Mongolia was part of the Qing territory. And they also brought Tibet and Xinjiang under its rule. So now you're overlooking a very big empire with different peripheries or borderlines of diverse people who spoke different languages and probably all not all uh, willing to yield to the Manchu rule, right? And the Manchu Qing rulers managed to maintain a solid rule over all these different people uh, in a large empire for 260 years. That's something quite amazing, especially if you read the article from China in and beyond headlines, you realize that it is still a challenge for the People's Republic of China to keep all the ethnic parts under control. And that's with modern technology and a very strong army and a very strong modern state by the Communist Party. So what was the secret of the Manchu Qing to keep all these different people pacified under its rule? Is the last question we're gonna look at. Um, ruling a multi multi ethnic empire. So, in the last lecture and just now, we have talked about how expensive and diverse the Manchu Qing China was. There are different factors that could pull this big empire apart. There were certain uh, factors that hold the Chinese empire together, right? Confucianism as the cultural glue centralized bureaucracy, unified written language, although people speak different dialogues. So all these factors make it easier, relatively easier to keep, for example, the Ming Dynasty together. Uh, I hope you guys still remember that the Ming Dynasty occupied mainly China proper. But when the Manchus brought all these different people under its rule, you need different ruling techno uh, techniques other than you know these cultural or bureaucratic techniques. So I want to give you guys a short 
uh, several seconds to think about all the different geography components you read from the introduction, especially in China's borderlands, right? Xinjiang, Tibet, Manchuria as well, and Mongolia. So we're all on the periphery of the empire, and they're very easy to drift away from the center, which once again speak for the importance of keeping the emperor together. Now, we talk about Kangxi as an example of the sage Confucian king to keep the Chinese happy. We can talk about another important Qing emperor, Qianlong, who reinvented himself not only to be the Confucian sage king, but more importantly, a universal ruler who could converse with different peoples with different in different languages and customs. And I want to give you different examples for that, right? So by the time of Qianlong, which is what we know as a Hai Qing period, when the Qing entered a really stable and uh, strong period, the Hai Qing period, Qianlong was thinking, we cannot just be the sage king to make the Chinese happy. We have to show them the Han as civilized and populous as it is. It's just one component of our multi-ethnic empire. Now we have the Tibetans and the Chinese Muslims and the Mongols in our empire. We have to show them that. So just showing myself, the emperor, as someone the Chinese like is not enough. It's gonna probably alienate other people in my empire. So he made himself a universal king who could have dialogues, dialogues with all these people, but who is above them all. So uh, he used different strategies to maintain the tie with different people. In terms of the Mongols, the Manchus and the Mongols were always in a much more friendly uh, relationship than with the Chinese, probably because they were all identified as a nomad, nomadic people by the Chinese. And their language are pretty close. Even before the Manchus conquered China, the Manchu royalty or the Manchu aristocracy had this habit of marrying Mongol aristocracy. They definitely continue with that practice. Among the 13 emperors of the Qing dynasty, a majority of them had married a Mongol princess as their formal wife. And, you know, they also have multiple concubines, imperial concubines, but their formal wife had to be a member of the Mongol, of the Mongol uh, nobility. Okay. So, as we said before, uh, Mongol language was also used as one of the three key languages in official documents. And in terms of Xinjiang, let's see if we have a map. Xinjiang is kind of far away in the northwestern part of China. And it took three emperors uh, from, uh, from Kangxi to Yongzheng to Qianlong to pacify a Mongol tribe that had ruled Xinjiang before this time. So they used hardcore military campaign in Xinjiang to gain the land and keep it pacified. So the strategy is very different um, with the strategy against the Mongols in Inner Mongolia or Outer Mongolia. For that particular Mongol tribe, the Manchu Emperor almost adopted a racial, a, a racial geno genocide policy to kill them all and leave the Xinjiang a no strong man's land so it could be pacified as a part of the Manchu Empire. And now I want to really talk about the story of the Tibet, a very interesting story. Okay, So Tibet was controlled by the same Mongol tribe who used to control Xinjiang. So once Xinjiang was brought under the territory, under the rule of the Manchus, so was Tibet. And Tibet always had their own ruler, not military strong, but um, they had a theocracy, which means that their religious head 
the Dalai Lama was also their political ruler. And the Manchu Qing Emperor, uh, especially the Qianlong Emperor we're talking about, really invested in his relation with the Dalai Lama. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Tibetan religion and their theocracy. Uh, how it works is that um, Tibet practice a certain branch of Buddhism. There are several branches of Buddhism popular in Tibet, they are, and they are given a general name of Tibetan Buddhism. Among them, the yellow hat branch is the dominating one, and the head of the yellow hat branch is the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama is not really a certain person, it's more of a title. The Tibetans believe that there is one living spirit who could live eternally as a Dalai Lama, the enlightened one. But the Dalai Lama had to be reincarnated onto different human being forms to manifest himself and to guide his secular followers. So before every generation of the Dalai Lama dies, he would give signals for his followers to look for the next human form of the Dalai Lama, which usually is a very young little boy. And the young little boy would be identified and brought to the Batala Palace and educated with Tibetan Buddhist texts. That would be the next Dalai Lama. So the Qianlong Emperor, first of all, after pacifying Xinjiang and Tibet, Xinjiang is a different story, but first of all, he stationed an army and a civil official to control Tibet, to take over its financial system, to start to tax the Tibetans. Right now, the Tibetans not only have to give their part of their income to the Dalai Lama, but also indirectly to the Qianlong Emperor and they changed the currency in Tibet as well. Now, the currency in Tibet had to bear the image of the Qianlong Emperor to remind the Tibetans every day that they are not just one people, they are actually one of the many people of this big empire. But more importantly, and the most smart thing that the Qianlong Emperor did is to form a personal relationship with the Dalai Lama. At his time, it was the turn of the seventh Dalai Lama, right? The current one is the 14th one. And when the seventh Dalai Lama was still a little boy, the Qianlong Emperor brought him to Beijing for education. And there was no precedent before that. The Dalai Lama always lived in the Patala Palace, serving as the circular, secular and the religious head. So the Emperor brought the Dalai Lama to grow up in Beijing and educate him and associate with him, socialize with him uh, very frequently. So from an early age, the Dalai Lama had developed an intimate relationship with the Manchu royalties. After he reached adulthood, he was returned to Tibet. But you can imagine that relationship is much more stable than otherwise. And the Qianlong Emperor also showed respect, sincere, respect to Tibetan Buddhism. He adopted Tibetan Buddhism as the official religion of the Manchu royal family. And he respected the Dalai Lama as a mentor. And the Dalai Lama respected the Qianlong Emperor as a ruler. So the Manchu Qing and the Tibet relationship can be summarized as the mentor-ruler relationships between the two figureheads uh, of the two ethnic groups or political unity. I think this is something that's very strategic and uh, in a way works much more effective than simple military conquest or incorporation of the finance or other uh, taxation system. And here you have image to show that not only Qianlong Emperor respect the Dalai Lama as the religious mentor of his he also imagined himself and portrayed himself as a reincarnation of a certain Buddhist figure, a certain Buddhist deity, this 
the state known as the Manchuri, which is similar to the pronunciation of the Manchu, right? In a way to again um, form a close tie between the Manchus and the Tibetans by reinventing himself as a Tibetan, as a Tibetan Buddhist deity. Okay. So that's the story with Tibet. Now Tibet is obviously an ongoing issue, and you know the Chinese government had used different strategies from the time of the 1959 to uh, the current, the contemporary era, to keep the Tibetans, um, you know, settled and part of the Chinese Chinese nation, but it had not been very successfully. And I think it has something to learn from the, from the you know the Manchu rulers in a religious way, in a cultural way, and in many other ways. Now to uh, summarize what we have just said, right? Qianlong as a universal king. We didn't really get into the southwestern part of China, but uh, the many ethnic groups in southwestern part of China were even less civilized than the Manchus or the Mongols. They, you know, didn't read and write and they were still hunters who live in a very primary mode of economy. Anyway, so uh, the Qin Emperor started to educate and assimilate the people, ethnic groups in the Southwest. Sim assimilation and education as the same um, cultural project. So we won't get too much into that. But to summarize, the Qianlong Emperor was the most productive poet in Chinese history, although people also make fun of his lack of literary talent to be a good poet, but he was certainly the most productive one. And he did no less impressively than his grandfather, Kangxi Emperor, in dressing himself up as a Confucian scholar when, whenever it is necessary. But um, he also added many new things that the Kangxi Emperor did not do. He maintained and strengthened the tie with the Mongols by marrying more than one Mon Mongolian wife by speaking Mongolian with his Mongol relatives and organizing uh, the martial events in Inner Mongolia. He used hardcore policies to kill off any opponent in Xinjiang and brought the lar large territory of the Xinjiang under his control. And he civilized and assimilated the population in the Southwest. And he maintained that mentor ruler relationship with the Dalai Lama to keep settled a part of the Manchu Emperor Empire that was most difficult to deal with, which is Tibet. Actually, it was also during the Qian, uh, during the Qing Dynasty that uh, Taiwan became part of. We can't really say Taiwan became part of China because China is not the same China as it is today, but it definitely became part of the Qing Empire. And later on, the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China are going to claim that Taiwan should be part of what they have inherited from the Qing. Okay, so again, Qianlong as a universal king to illustrate how the Manchus successfully brought the different peoples and different cultures under control. That should be all for today. And next time, we're going to talk about a time in decline for the Manchu Qing rule by um, starting with the encounter with the West, the Opium War. Okay, I look forward to the discussion and keep thinking about the questions I raised in today's class. We're going to talk about them during the discussion session. See you later.